one in five Americans suffer with a mental illness. Um, you know, over seven million children, adolescents, suffer from mental illness, and that's 2018. Um, and those are the ones that are diagnosed. Welcome to the Revolution of One podcast, where the revolution will not only be televised, but also individualized. Today's guest is Anish Patel. Anish is the founder of Azalea Home Care and Play ATL. Today, we're going to talk about the challenges of mental health and how to translate personal difficulties into entrepreneurial opportunities. Anish, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Anish, what I find most compelling about your story is that it's a great illustration of taking personal setbacks and transforming them into entrepreneurial opportunities. We talked earlier about how your mother suffered pretty early on from mental illness. And there was a point in your life where you had to put your entire life on pause to take care of her. And then that was a significant part of your journey. Can you walk me through that? Yeah, so I mean, ever since I can remember, um, my mother was diagnosed with paranoid, uh, or she was a considered paranoid schizophrenic. Um, and this did not really run in her family. Um, and it was something that came on later on during the time that my father was married with her. So um, when I was born, it was a different type of childhood. I think um, growing up, a lot of people were, you know, they didn't know how to react with her if she said things. Uh, luckily, she was nonviolent. I mean, she still is nonviolent. She's just more verbal. Um, and I think understanding that type of individual at an early age allowed me to understand personalities in general. That, that, that's that's kind of where I know I mentioned earlier I, I uh, was I had a hospitality background, so I've always was um, you know a people person, um, and that kind of led me into you know, the next phase of going into um, um, trying to help people, with similar needs, um, whether it be you know mental illness or physical disabilities, um, and I think that you know that's that was kind of a driving point, mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to my grandmother getting ill, so um, but yeah. I, you know, when you, when you talk about that, that empathy that you had to have since you were a child, um, we talked earlier about how that's something that can be lacking in the world when it comes to uh, mental illness. And, and one of the things that you said is that it's because mental illness is stigmatized in a way that other disabilities or difficulties are not. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> you can take an example of, of um, somebody, on the, somebody on the street walking and um, say they fall down, they, they, have a, they have a limp, or um, something's going on with them physically. Mm -hmm. um, you can imagine the, the chaos that could ensue, people running to that person's side. Now, take that same situation and flip it into somebody just incoherently talking and, and rambling on, walking by you, um, and you'll see that, I think, some people might not be thinking this, but you'll probably see that most people, if not a portion of the people, will walk by that individual and not pay too much attention because it's, it's something that is not quote unquote normalized on, on how conversation should be or what is viewed in society as acceptable. Um, so I think, you know, um, that mental illness side of things and, and just, um, you know, physical disabilities compared to mental disabilities, it's, 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 it's not, it's stigmatized for um, reasons that honestly, um, I, th I think it goes into further, um, you know, discussions on, on our healthcare system in general and how we treat members of society a certain way. And I think that is contributing factor to how people view these individuals that suffer day to day. And I think it's one in five Americans suffer with a mental illness. Um, you know, over seven million children, adolescents, suffer from mental illness, and that's 2018. Um, and those are the ones that are diagnosed. So there's people out there with, you know, anxiety issues and, um, and you know, personality disorders and um, that bipolar disorder that, that just kind of go on under the radar, you know, so. Yeah, well, you know, if, it's like if I injure my foot, then I don't have this sense of, I shouldn't be going through this. I have a sense of, I didn't ask for this. This isn't what I want. Let me get the help that I need. 
But when I'm suffering from anxiety, it, it, it feels like something is wrong with me in a way that I'm responsible for. You know, and, and even when we think about our relationship to the, the physical world, we all know what it means to not be in control, right? I can't make the world bend to my will. But when it comes to my thoughts, I, I can choose to change a thought. And, 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 and it seems like there's something about having mental issues that, that feels like I should be able to change it. Do, mm -hmm. do, do you think that's, that's a part of what makes people not speak up about it or not ask for help because they feel like it's their fault? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, people that suffer from different types of uh, mental illness, they are in the down place, you know, and, and they, it's so hard for them to get out of that. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years is that ha trying to communicate with somebody that's suffering uh, internally and trying to be that positive reinforcement for them and try to get them out of that hole actually sometimes keeps them in, in that place. It's, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's, it's a weird, weird way of thinking of things, but um, I mean, just my personal experiences dealing with these individuals, um, sometimes they just need to have that moment of, of self-clarity for themselves to get mm -hmm. out of the hole. Um, and you pushing them as trying to be, as any friend or family member would wanna do, sometimes it has an adverse effect. Um, but I absolutely agree with you. Um, now, almost every person who's been on this show has had some kind of story about a time in their lives where they were, they were uh, the victim of self-defeating thoughts or they had a bad attitude about this or anger issues with that. And, and they kind of will themselves into a better mind, mental state by reading a lot of self-help or just by like rethinking their goals and so forth. What's the difference between mental illness and the kind of self-defeating thoughts that can be overcome through self-help? Or is there a difference at all? Um, I mean, there's definitely a gray area. Um, you know, people can definitely get out of um, some of these issues that they're dealing with, um, with self-help, with meditation, exercise. I mean, these are proven things that can help, help you get out of the hole. But I think, um, you know, mental illness is, is it's also, um, you know, it's, it's your biological makeup. It's, sometimes it's genetics. Um, some, you know, you can't always get out of that. Um, and, and individuals that suffer from this don't, um, you know, they, individuals that may not suffer from this, they can get out of the hole quick. Um, they can, um, you know, have a bad day and then the next day they're okay about it. They, they, they look at it as a, like a grain of salt, whereas someone that's really suffering, it's, it's very, it's debilitating. And um, um, I think, you know, to answer your question, I think there's, there is a difference. It's very thin line. And, and like you said, stated before, it's, it's hard for people to come out. So there are a lot of members, you know, a lot, a lot of people in society that just don't come out and they're just kind of just stuck there. So I really like your uh, analogy of like between like physical injury and, 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 and mental illness. Um, when it comes to physical injury, we, we all kind of know where to go. If my foot's broken, I, I know to go to, the do to go to the doctor. Where do you go if you are suffering from anxiety and you're not even sure that you, you have a mental illness? Um, you can definitely Google uh, National Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, there's a lot of resources and it does state by state. Um, you know, I would also um, look into um, the state level programs, you know, georgia.gov, and then you can even see, you know, Department of Community Health is there to kind of support that. Um, but, you know, that's just local on that local level in Georgia. But um, nationally, that would probably be the best bet if you Google it. Let's talk about the work that you're doing. Um, going back to your mother's story, you grew up in that context, but it wasn't always your primary responsibility mm. to take care of her. When did that change? Um, well, it's a dual effort, and it's, and it's uh, I mean, it's, um, you know, between my father and myself, we help each other out. Um, and she's, you know, she's still, she functions like, you know, she'll have her good and bad days. And she's, you know, she's on her meds. Um, but when it changed, I honestly, I think more so towards high school. I think, you know, coming in and assisting more um, to help my father out and just, you know, if she's having 
um, a moment that uh, she needs to kind of get away from a group of people if we're in a physical, I mean, a personal environment with family and friends, um, just making sure we calm her down and, and just, you know, get her to a point where she feels comfortable. And if she doesn't, we, we you know, we, we work with her to, you know, go somewhere else and you know, just try to try to be a support system for her. Yeah. yeah. Now, from a professional standpoint, um, you were working in sales and marketing in the hotel industry for a while. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you said, I, I, I think I'm going to go into business helping people who have these kinds of challenges. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the crucial factor that changed that decision? And tell me about your journey into starting yeah. your business. So, it, I mean, in addition to my mother, um, you know, my, in the Indian culture, we're very tight knit. So uh, our, you know, my grandmother basically raised me from birth, uh, along with my brother as well. And, um, you know, she got ill herself and we needed, first it was, you know, just rehab. Um, and then slowly became, um, you know, she had some emergency stints and then finally coming back home, we had to go into hospice. During this whole period of time, um, right before hospice, I made the decision to go ahead and apply for a um, private home care provider licensure. Um, and um, that was back in 2009, 2010. It took about a year and a half um, to get the license, a lot of red tape. Um, dealing with the government and dealing with the state level. Um, but that was m the big push. Um, and it was, it was more so just seeing what they were doing day to day at my family's home and understanding that there's such a big need, you know, and, and um, that was, you know, that was the biggest push that I had to, while working at the hotel and, you know, after my shifts ended, working on getting this packet submitted. And then once I got the packet submitted, it was kind of like a surreal moment. I got the packet submitted and shortly after my grandmother passed away. Mm. So it was, it was one of those moments where it's kind of, you know, one new beginning and an end of something. So, yeah. um, but I use that, that is my main drive. You know, that's in our office. Um, it's on the wall, the story about her, story about kind of where I come from. My employees see it. Uh, my managers see it daily, and it just drives home that um, legacy is important in whatever you do in business and life. If you're living to have a legacy or create a legacy, you're doing something right because that's ultimately why are we here on this earth to to really do something to give back to our fellow man and woman, and. Um, you know, every job has a purpose, like every career has a purpose, right? To help something which also helps another person, right? And it could be, whether it be in healthcare, it could be in, in, in finance, it can be in um, you know, construction. And, and your grandma was that person for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What was the biggest thing you learned from her? Um, being selfless. I think that's a trait that carried down to her son, my father, and the entire family. Like we're very, um, we like to help people, even if it might, you know, even if there's there's got there's no benefit to me, but it doesn't matter, yeah. and, and because to to me it's helping helping someone um, get somewhere is 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 a is a high for me, yeah. and and that also allows you know that person to go somewhere, and and you have that self, you know, you have that satisfaction knowing that you help somebody achieve something or even just get out of something, you know, and, and um, yeah, so being selfless is probably the biggest. You know, for, for people that aren't hardwired that way, uh, or who maybe didn't come from a home where they have a grandmother like yours who models that for them, being selfless can easily seem like a big act of self-compromise. I got to get mine first, right, yeah. before I help somebody else. What would you say to someone who, who sees being selfless as being antithetical with their own well-being. So, if I look at it in like a business, um, in the business arena, right? So, an example I would give is, you know, when I first started my business, I made a lot of sacrifice to, for the well-being of my employees, my managers, and 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 my business partner, everybody that we worked with. I gave, I looked at the numbers, and I took it down to a level where. 
I may have not personally had the gains like a, like a normal business in, in my arena had, but knowing that I'm creating something to help grow a foundation that eventually will translate into dollars and cents or in general, just the growth of the company. So if you look at it like that way, I think it's very important. Um, when you help an individual um, or you help um, you know, someone else going into it with, with the feeling that where's mine or where, you know, what am I getting out of this, you're not gonna, you, you, if you keep doing that enough, you're not gonna succeed. So people see through you if you're coming in with an alter, ulterior motive. You know, and that, that, that's important that people understand that, um, especially in, in, in business, you do want to make sure you take care of, of the people regardless. If you really are trying to get involved with something that you're passionate about, and that, that, that yeah. goes into something you know, else, if you're not passionate about it, then, I mean, then you're just chasing. You're chasing money, you're chasing um, accolades, you're chasing um, your own personal like vendetta almost, and that yeah. shouldn't be the case. It should be a genuine thing that you're trying to do, and everything else will work itself out. That's, that, that's, you have to go into it like that. Yeah. yeah. That's a profound understanding, too, because it, it essentially says service isn't just about you saying, I'm going to place blind faith in this moral rule that says I have to be this way even though I get nothing out of it. <clears throat> it's a recognition that in some sense we're all connected. And when I make your life better, it enriches me, even if not in obvious ways. Yeah. My, my, my dad would always put it this way. He would always say, uh, what goes around comes around, but it doesn't always come in a roundabout way. You yeah. know? So, so may, maybe you do something that helps out another person, and that person may not do anything for you directly, but it comes back to you some kind of way, even if only in the mindset that you develop by just doing the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Azalea is the name of your yeah. home care company. Tell me a little bit about the work that you do. Where did that name come from, by the way? So uh, originally Azalea Home Care was on um, Azalea Drive in Tucker, Georgia. Okay. So um, we just used the name from there. And we've recently moved to here in Gwinnett County, so not too far from here. Um, the work that we do is predominantly um, home care services for the elderly. Um, we do anything you may take for granted, personal care, bathing, toileting, um, you know, changing your clothes, um, brushing your teeth, combing your hair. Those are you know, extreme cases where you're doing everything, but there's portions of that as we age that become a challenge. And so we assist with those things. We work with um, also rehab clinics to you know, post-surgery rehab. We come in and assist members with um, getting back, you know, um, getting back up to speed, um, getting them to their, um, you know, their appointments on time. Um, you know, that's most of the work we do. Um, and, you know, back end stuff that doesn't get seen a lot, and that I think um, is important is if we see a member that may not be able to afford what we're what we're doing, we're lo we're looking for other um, alternative ways to assist them through different waiver programs. Um, Georgia has. You know programs that benefit some low-income individuals that need that attention, um, that can't afford it, um, and we go and fight for them. We advocate for them, and and, and that's important um, to get them services just like anybody else. You know, and with that dignity and respect that they deserve. Um, so we'll we'll go and we'll go through the process through the state um, um, program, and 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 they'll get similar hours, if not sometimes more, which is great for them and their family members. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of what we do. Now, when I think about your story and what you do now, it seems like your life has optimized you for this. It seems like, oh, of course, of course he's following his calling. He's doing the thing that he was created to do. Um, but there's always something that doesn't happen easily for you. What's that thing for you? So, I mean, um, I think during this process, um, a lot of hurdles. I mean, a, a lot of the extra red tapes that are put on programs to help individuals or just to even get my foot in the door were not given to me right away. And I think that 
and, and I didn't expect it to be. I mean, it's just any business, open, any entrepreneur, any business owner will tell you, opening up a business is part one, you know, knowing what you're selling, your products or whatever, and part two, dealing with how to get everything operational and dealing with the city, dealing with the state, dealing with all different levels. That was a big challenge. Um, and then not really having that medical background. I'm just, I'm just being honest, like going into it, I had a passion to do it. We wrote our policies and procedures from scratch. Um, and I utilized what I had. I utilized friends that were RNs. I utilized physician friends. Um, and it somehow, way, shape, or form got yeah. there. And I, you know, I, I even had to the point where I had the director um, call me and they were like, listen, I know you're, you really want to do this, but are you ready for the next step? Because you're almost there, you're getting there, but I wanted to reach out to you personally because you, you are getting into another area now. Once you do get this application back and you're approved um, as a provider, you under, do you understand how to take that to the next level? And, and what did you say? I, so I, I told her, I said, well, for a year and a half, I've been, um, you know, calling you, emailing <laughs> you, trying to figure out what my documents are missing. Um, and then, you know, you would you'd come back and you give me somewhat answers. And that's what, unfortunately, sometimes that they do, you know, when you're trying to submit some packet. Um, but during that process, I met and I came across a lot of individuals that were willing to help and uh, to guide me. And um, I just basically told her that, you know, I have a lot of, I have a great support team and um, we're ready. And, you know, now when I call her and, you know, she, she knows that we do good work and, you know, and um, I call her for anything now, you know, because <laughs> like, because she got tired of uh, me, me, you know, picking, picking her brain and like, oh, so is this okay? Is, you know, is this all right? You know, so. What I, what I love about that is that she became a resource to you mm -hmm. in response to your persistence. You could have, you had every reason in the world to just say, to give up on her and say, oh, well, she doesn't like me, she doesn't respect me, yeah. but you, you stuck with it and eventually you commanded her respect. That's, that's a powerful story. Yeah. yeah so sure. you, you have a side hustle as well yeah. that, that's been growing quite a bit and, yeah. and, you, and you don't just do the home care, but you also are the founder for Play ATL. Yeah. T tell me about that. So Play ATL is a company that we created. Actually, it's a sister company to um, a, another one called Trendsetter Events. It was an idea that we came up with in college, in undergrad. Um, and we basically did social gatherings yeah. We for, for anywhere from 18 and up to 21 and up. Um, and we organized the artists, the, um, the venue, um, the concepts for the themes of the events. Um, and it was great. It started off with an idea. Our, our first event was at the Fox Theater, Egyptian Ballroom downtown or Midtown. And that was for New Year's. And we had about um, almost 1,100 people show up. So it was exciting. Once we did that one event, we kept on going. Um, you know, eventually Play ATL became something. You know, a lot of my friends, they, you know, became entrepreneurs themselves or they, you know, accountants and all the people that were part of that in college drifted. I kept up with it and, and we started branching out into restaurant consulting. So we would go with different restaurants, um, you know, curate an event, um, create, build up and help, help their revenue stream grow on days that they would normally not really be seeing anything. So it's a good transition, I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties now and, um, you know, my friends and, and the people we target are people that want to have really good food and have live music and, and also, um, be able to bring their kid out. That's okay. You know, and it could be a family thing or it could be, you know, individuals just wanting to grab a, a drink on a Saturday and, and enjoy some music as well. And, and, and learn about the chef and what the chef is bringing to the table, because that's kind of what we do as well. So. So if people want to want to stay in tune with with uh, what the events are, what's happening, how do they find out more? So um, we are on you know Instagram, social media, um, on Facebook. It's Passion Fueled by Music. Okay. Um, so that's the that's um, um, that the link for that. And then on um, Instagram, it's Play underscore ATL. Um, 
and then you know we do a, a, a brunch series, so it's called Toast Brunch ATL as well. But you'll find everything on Play ATL on, yeah. on Instagram, Play underscore ATL. Anish, where do you find the time, man? You're, you're helping your dad, taking care of your mom, running a home care business, yeah. and you're doing this, and this sounds pretty comprehensive, Play ATL. Yeah. Your it's time a, management game must just be another level. It's, it's good. I mean, I can, I can, that's one thing I can definitely work on. I mean, that's, I mean every, everyone can work on time management, but my father would probably tell you that's one of, the, my, one of my weaker points. I can get there. I have a lot of things going on. I think what, what allows me to do what I do is a great team. Like, I have a team mm. with Play ATL. I have a team at Azalea Home Care. Um, and you have to delegate, you know, any, any entrepreneur. Like, it's hard to run a business when you want to do everything and not give, give somebody some control. Like if you don't get that control and you don't give that them, them that control, then yeah. you're up a creek with a paddle and, and you're going in circles. So that's uh, something I learned the hard way. I mean, a lot of people will tell you that too, um, but you have to delegate properly and um, you have to make people in your team understand that there's value to what they do. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, taking it, you, know, you, you don't want to take, make them feel they're getting taken advantage of and they, they need to be known that they're part of the team, which they are. And in my case, everyone that works with me, um, that's, you know, the feedback I get is like, you know, you're really respect, respectful of my time and taking consideration uh, my family time too, um, even with staffing and, and how I communicate that with my, my clients and my members in the home on the home care side is that basically you know you also have to consider their time too like and you know a lot of a lot of members want somebody great for their loved one and I want to give provide that service but sometimes they they don't realize that you also have to respect them a little bit because once you start respecting their time they will jump over the moon to take care of your mom your dad mm. your daughter your son and that's just um, something that I kind of preach from the get-go on, on all different areas, you know, so, yeah. yeah. So I have, I have two questions about surrounding yourself with, with good talent. First, for the entrepreneurs out there who have the resources to build a great team around them, but, but they just struggle with knowing the ins and outs of identifying good talent, what's the key to building a great team? And then the second is for those people out there who would love to have team support, but they just feel like they don't even have the, the resources to make that happen. How do they get to that point where they even have that as an option? Okay, so the first question, I mean, first question I can answer is, it's your hiring process. Like trying yeah. to find somebody on the part of your team, you really have to um, hone in on them as an individual, somewhat outside of work too, um, you know, not <laughs> going into their personal lives, but, Hone into what type of individual they are as as a family man, or if, um, you know, uh, um, you know, it could be single mother, it could be it could be whatever they're dealing with. But see how much how much they're giving back in their own space before coming in, in into your space. Um, and I mean, you know, there's no right answer to that because the problem I, I find out is I always try to learn you know, from other entrepreneurs, other business owners, and they tell me the same thing. It's like, if you, if you have the answer, please tell me, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> yeah. but, but really you do to get the right person to be a part of your team. It's trial by error. You learn certain things over time. You just have to keep asking questions. You have to, and if it's, it's, it's specific to a certain arena, um, I would, it would be, it'd be in their best interest to create some type of almost like an exam or some type of questionnaire to really get that, those answers that you're looking for. Mm. And based on that questionnaire, then you can call them back into your office or however you set up that time to get a team member. Um, but I think that would be important too, if, you know, yeah. to get him there. And then the second part is, I think um, you were mentioning, um, you know, without the resources, how can you get there? I mean, we're in the age of technology. You can, I mean, there should be a way, if somebody like myself that didn't have that background can get that information, look at, look at people in your surrounding areas, you know, ask the questions, Google things. But the first, first step to get out there is don't question the resources holding you back. Question your drive to get there. If you can, mm. if you can get there, then 
that that whole mindset of resources are kind of holding me back, that shouldn't be at the forefront. The forefront is I need to get up out of this chair and go and do it. And even if I'm not, even if it doesn't sound right, me getting up, I'm going to learn something. You're going to learn something through you actually getting up and making the move to do something. I want everyone who's watching this to spend the rest of their time thinking about what you just said there. So I'm gonna end it here. Anish, thanks so much, man, for sharing your story and your insights. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. To find out more about our guest, Anish Patel, you can follow him on Instagram at instagram.com slash Anish P84. Also, check us out on Instagram at instagram.com slash revolution of one. That's the number one. Also, check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash fee online and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play and Spotify via our website fee.org slash rev one. Don't forget to leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.